Well, thank you very much for uh, attending one more of our, our new case review. Uh, this is actually our third case review uh, since we started this new series uh, for our YouTube channel. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the implant assisted overdenture. I know this is a topic that has generated a lot of interest, and I always want to start thanking uh, the companies that make this channel 100% free. Uh, and thank, it's, it's, it's definitely thanks to their support. These are Colteen, Oral Arts Dental Laboratories, and Romero Dental Seminars. I also want to guide you uh, and recommend you visit our webpage, RomeroDentalSeminars.com. Um, uh, in our webpage, you will find valuable information in relationship or in regards to our, you know, to our hands-on courses that we have throughout the United States. Uh, we have one coming up uh, September 15 and 16 in Atlanta, Georgia. That will be our porcelain veneer master class, which is actually 100% sold out. Um, I really want to thank everybody that uh, that uh, uh, registered for the course. Uh, we are so much looking forward to meeting you in person in Atlanta in, in, in uh, just a couple of more weeks. So uh, I want you to know that we're ready for you, and I know that you're going to enjoy that course tremendously. So thank you again one more time, and don't forget, if you haven't uh, subscribed to our webpage, please do so. Uh, I also want to um, uh, invite you to visit our YouTube channel. If you are new to this, to, to, to our channel, we want to thank you for uh, being part of it. If you are coming back, we want to thank you even more for supporting us. Uh, without your visits, without your, you know, your thumbs up and watching our videos, I promise you we wouldn't be doing this. So, uh, um, you know, we're, we're very, very thankful. And we want to continue to grow. We want to continue to have new subscribers. We're, we're, we're reaching our 40,000 subscriber uh, um, pretty soon. But, you know, there's still a long way to go to get 100,000 subscribers and, and honestly be recognized by YouTube. So please, if you can help us just hitting that button and subscribe and just get, you know, alerts, just get email alerts of any new content that we upload in our channel. We do it constantly. Uh, that, I, I would really appreciate you doing that. So let's start with our with our case for today. Uh, so my case today is um, is is is, a, is this, these are the extras of my patient. It's a case where we're going to extract multiple teeth and we're going to place a couple of implants. And the reason that's the reason why we call these the implant assisted overdenture. Now uh, I know that there are other options and you know fixed options for for edentulous patients, but you know one of the things when I'm looking at cases and I'm kind of figuring out is this a good case for me to extract all the teeth and replace this with implants. Is there anything I can do to try to save any of these teeth? And, and we do have a, a webinar that we spoke about terminal dentition where we reviewed an algorithm that we commonly use to help us in that decision-making process of what patients to actually extract all their teeth and, and one patients, what patients not to do that and try to save some of their teeth and use them you know, in, in, in any way that we can in our, in our prosthetic rehabilitation means. For this particular case, so if you haven't watched that webinar, please go ahead and watch it. That will help you understand this case and, and other cases that we're going to present to you, to you uh, much better. For but this particular patient, you know, he had a lot of missing teeth. He had a lot of fractured teeth, a lot of periapical lesions, active periodontal disease, and some you know active bone loss in some areas with a secondary decay underneath crowns. I mean, there was just a lot of things going on that needed to be. Uh, that needed to be addressed. And, you know, one of the things that I also consider for patients like this is their financial means. If, if the patient, you know, can't afford, you know, six implants, why am I even going to put that in a treatment plan? For this, and this is one of the, one one good example for that. This patient, he only could afford two of the, two implants and uh, and we were going to give him just a regular denture on the upper arch and an implant assisted over denture on the mandibular arch. Now, this is something that I do very commonly in my practice. My practice uh, here in Florida is um, it's not, you know, extremely wealthy patients. The majority of them are just middle class patients. And, you know, many of them just can't afford, you know, two or four implants. And when two or four implants are, are, are of, you know, something that my patient can do, I always tend to place them on the mandibular arch because that's really the denture they're going to have issues with. I know that I can do a really good job at, at, at a maxillary denture. If I have enough ridge, if I have enough extension of my denture basis, I know I can create really, really good suction. But the mandibular arch is the one that gives them a little bit more, it's a little bit more challenging for all of us. Uh, I, I know I can get a lot of stability and retention for my denture, but nothing like adding a couple of implants and just 
helping this patient with more retention, stability, and support given by those implants. So what we decided to do for this patient was extract all the maxillary teeth. You can see the left-hand photo pre prior to the extractions, the left-hand photo, I mean, I'm sorry, the right-hand photo after the extractions. Same thing done on the mandibular arch. And here's where I want to take a little bit more time to share with you a couple of things that I, 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 you know, I always wanted you to look, I always talk about, we have to look into this. We have to make sure that we understand what we're trying to accomplish. This is the mandibular arch for the patient. We extracted all those teeth. But if you think about it, not only that, you end up having an irregular, irregular uh, uh, edentulous ridge because you had all these peaks and valleys, you know, bone loss in some areas, you had recession in some other areas, you had decay in other areas. So you have this bone that is very irregular once you remove uh, all these teeth. But not only that, it's irregular, it's very thin. Because as we know, all these, uh, all the recession and all, and the cervical aspect of all these mandibular incisors, it, it, it thins out, toward, it's, it's very thin towards the cervical aspect of the tooth. So the bone is also very thin there. So by us removing and you know re reducing some of that bone and flattening this ridge, what we're really trying to accomplish is just to create a wider ridge, buckle lingually, buckle lingual width, so that we can actually place our fixtures, place our implants in a in in, in a much wider uh, bone. And so we have more bone available to be able to surround this implant 360 degrees with uh, uh you know uh, the patient's bone. So that's one of the reasons that we want to make sure that we flatten the ridge. But the other reason is also because you need to have prosthetic space. If you have and you're happy with the incisal ledge, the current incisal ledge position of the patient is, and you want to try to reproduce that in your final denture, well, think about it. You know, you have to have room for the teeth, room for the denture base, and room for the abutments that you're going to place on top of the implants. So you need to compensate for that. You need to remove some of some bone in order for you for, to compensate for all those layers that you're going to need to recreate in order for you to place those teeth exactly where you want them. So all this needs to be planned ahead of time. It needs to be planned during that treatment planning phase, photography, you know, trial, try-ins of partial dentures. If you have, if you have some teeth and you want to just add some teeth here and there just to see, okay, am I happy with this position of the incisal ledge? All those things need to be tested prior to your day of your surgery. So that when you're doing your surgery, you know exactly how much bone you need to remove. Now, in, in the case of over dentures, it's a little bit more forgiving. It doesn't need to be that exact because Again, you know, you can play a lot more with the height of the abutment because you have either a locator or a uh, Nova Lock type of system. They're very, very small. But if you're going to go and do a hybrid, a fixed prosthesis, now this becomes extremely crucial. You have to be much more precise. And we do have a webinar on that, on how to use digital design reduction guides for greater, you know, for, for massive reductions. And most importantly, so that you can know exactly where that platform of the implant needs to be located in relationship to the new incisal light position once you've added all the layers that are needed for a hybrid or a fixed prosthesis case. I normally do that with my lab. You can also do it in-house. You can design it yourself. All you have to do is learn how to do it and know how to do it and trust what you're doing to make sure that you can use that technique. I use my lab and I communicate very well with them. And I'm happy with somebody that understands the process of designing better than I do, doing it for me. And then I just use it with my patients. And again, there is a webinar on how to use digitally designed uh, bone reduction guides. But for this case, for today, we're going to just show you this other case that was actually performed by one of my residents uh, a couple of years ago, Dr. Andrea Fernandez. You, uh, all of you know that I'm not in, 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 acad in, uh, in academics anymore. I'm in private practice again, but I still teach, I still lecture. So I'm still uh, a teacher by, in, uh, by heart, uh, but I used to be in Augusta, Georgia. I was there for nine years and I was a program director for an advanced education and general dentistry program. So she was one of my residents a couple of years ago um, when I was still in Georgia. This is one of her cases. I want to give her all the credit for the photos, for planning the case. I was only her mentor. I was only guiding her and trying to give her, you know, my experience. This was her first implant uh, ever case. So she needed a little bit of guidance and that's what I was there for. But I do want to give her full credit for the photos and for the actual surgery because she did it all. And I just, again, I was just there just trying to help her. Uh, uh, when we were planning this case with her, uh, you know, we decided that we were going to place two implants and an overdenture due to financial reasons. The patient already had a maxillary denture, as you saw in the previous photo. So all we needed to do was extract the mandibular, remaining mandibular teeth that were severely broken down. And then we were going to place these implants. 
when you're looking at the planning, you can see that we are already planning these implants to be lower than the actual crestal ridge of the patient at this point. So we were going to extract the teeth, reduce the bone three to five millimeters, and then place these these uh, these two implants. So she went ahead and she did some cross sections. She placed the implants and she just wanted to kind of figure out visually, okay, how much bone do I need to reduce? Just kind of measure in the CBCT. And she knew she was going to be between three to five millimeters, as you can see on number 22. Same for number 27, where you can see that it's actually a little bit deeper. And, and, and you can see that the root of the tooth that was still remaining was very short. So we knew that we were going to extract the tooth and we were going to go all the way down to the actual uh, uh, apex of that root uh, in order for us to you know, be at the right bone reduction level. So this is how you kind of guesstimate, if you want to use that word, when you're using an analog uh, guide as we're going to use for this case. But again, I already mentioned there are there are ways of doing this digitally. I think that for over dentures, doing using an analog uh, uh, guide is, is is more than acceptable because it really helps. And I'll show you in all the cases. This is the way I do it every single day. You can see now the CBCT, the two implants where they're located, their reference in relationship to the actual or existing roots of those teeth. And this is the guide. You know, Dr. Fernandez had taken a maxillary and mandibular final impressions. We send them to the lab and we got two uh, uh, interim dentures uh, for this patient. Um, those interim dentures, the mandibular one was duplicated and then we duplicated it using uh, orthoacrylic, as you can see, clear acry acrylic. And then we just placed, we, we, we cut the teeth down from canine to canine. We made this flat surface that you're seeing here on the photo. So it's very easy to just sit down very close to the actual bone, uh, to the actual bone, and then we fabricated these two holes where our pilot drills are going to go through, so that we can decide this is exactly where I want my implants located. So again, it's really, really helpful. Here are the, here's a reflection of the tissue. Teeth were extracted, and now we're going to start reducing that bone. How do we reduce the bone? You can see that she is now holding a straight hand piece with an acrylic lab bird that was sterilized, brand new. It's only used for bone reduction. And this is a carbide burr. And you can see it has a blue stripe on it. And you can see that she's literally holding, we've sutured the, the, the lingual flap so that there, it doesn't interfere with her cutting. She's using that Minnesota just to keep that lip and, and, and buckle flap away from the surgical site. And again, I'm gonna play it one more time. You can see that she's going from side to side just to make sure that everything is nice and smooth and even. You have to put pressure, you have to be cutting bone down. In this particular case, we had external irrigation. The irrigation was right on that on that burr. We don't wanna overheat the bone, but we're gonna cut and reduce, again, three to five millimeters uh, below the height that the patient currently had, so that now we can go ahead, and as you can see, everything is nice and smooth, nice and even. A couple of more things that I want you to know is that we use then a round burr a diamond round burr in a contra angle handpiece, surgical handpiece, and we round those angles that are right in between the lingual wall, the occlusal surface, the buccal wall, and the occlusal surface again. Those are always going to end up being sharp. You want to make sure that you smooth them out. You do not want them to end up being sharp because then you will, you know, it will affect and it will lacerate the tissue once you're trying to suture. So make sure that everything is nice and round, that you can put your finger around it. You don't feel any sharpness. Now you're going to go ahead and sit that. Uh, 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 the duplicate denture, the clear denture. You can see where those holes were located. She's going to go right through those holes with her pilot drill. And those are, that's right after her pilot drill. Again, very, very good photography, very good sequence of photography, very, very educational. You can see those pilot, the, the, the paralleling pings in those pilot holes. They're nice and parallel. This is exactly where the implants are going to go. We have her remove one of these, and then she continues with the drilling, the sequence of drilling on one of the sites. We place the implant there, then we go ahead and complete the second implant, just so that we can keep the reference of, of parallel. You can see we're taking photos from different angles, and then we wait six months. We start, we're going to work on our final dangers. The day of pickup, we're putting the locator attachments. You can see that they're nice and parallel one to the other, nice tissue, nice thick tissue band around them. And that's what they look like six months later. But right after my surgeries, what do they look like? They look like what you see on the right-hand side. You know, we flattened that bone. You can see that I've extracted all those teeth. There are all those septums, interradicular septums, and the bone was nice and flat. And I was able to make that nice and wide also so that I can play these two. I placed Strauman implants for this case. Previous case was with Zimmer implants. Uh, and now with this Strauman uh, implants in place, 
we go ahead, we put the healing abundance and we suture around it. And when you suture, you, you always want to be very delicate at the time that you're handling the tissue. When you suture, this is how it's going to look. There's two ways that you can suture. If you need more attached gingiva, you can, you know, separate the, the borders of your, of your, of your flaps a little bit more. Just don't tighten the sutures uh, a lot so that you have that secondary healing and that's when you're going to get that stronger tissue. But in this particular case, I felt that I had enough. I went ahead and I approximated my borders. This is probably 30 to 45 days after the surgery. Healing on the top still going on. Healing on the bottom, this is probably 60 days later. On the bottom, you can see that it's almost completely healed. Uh, we're still going to wait four to six months so that we can start working on our final dentures. But again, the critical aspect here to understand is I want to have room because this is where my incisor ledge position is going to be. I want to create room for all these layers that I need to place them. And if it's fixed, you're going to even need more room than what you just saw in this case. The other thing that I wanted to share with you is not only the surgical aspect, but also the restorative phase. How do I go about communicating with my lab in regards to the incisalized position location of the maxillary incisors and the mandibular incisors? How do I accomplish my vertical dimension? And how do I communicate with my lab all this information? So for this case, very easy to understand why we are trying to extract all these teeth. You know, there's no reason why we want to save any of these teeth. This particular case was managed with my dear friend, Dr. Roger Arce, who is a great periodontist. We were both in Augusta, Georgia for many years. We worked many cases together. This is one of them. He's now in Texas and I'm in, in, in Sarasota, Florida. So um, we, I, I referred him this case. He went ahead and extracted all the teeth for me. At that time, I didn't have a sedation permit. He was doing sedation. So he did this under sedation. That's what the patient wanted. That's the main reason why I referred him to Dr. Arson. And of course, his, his surgical skills are, are unparalleled. Um, he went ahead and removed all the teeth. He placed both of the mandibular implants. We did have a small, slight complication on the upper arch. There was a fenestration with the membrane sign with, with, with an sinuses. You can see that it was actually exposed uh, intraorally. But what we did is that Dr. Arce just, you know, Peridex and uh, and just kept it there with the with the with the immediate danger that the patient had. We kept everything nice and clean. I'll show you at the end how that was able to be covered completely with epithelium, uh, and, and I'll show you that in the final photo. But for now, that's what you're seeing: lower arch. Over here with both of the implants, very well located. Now I'm working on my dentures. And you can see that I, you know, conventionally you get this thick wax rim for both upper and lower arches, thick buccal lingually. Patient can't even, you know, you can't have any conversation with the patient. That's good for vertical dimension. For me, it's not good for phonetics. It's not good enough for me to locate that incisor life position. So I do it a little bit different. I get my denture bases and I add this very thin layer of wax that goes from canine to canine, maybe two millimeters thick. As you can see, this literally does kind of like what teeth would do on the front, on the on the incisor area. And I put it there at a just, you know, whatever height, I just guesstimate the height. And then I start working inside the patient's mouth. I have him smile. If I have to cut this down a little bit, I go ahead and cut it down and you'll see me do it. I'm taking different measurements. I say, okay, this is too long. This is too short. And I go ahead and I just start to modify that. You can see that I've evened it out a lot. Now the wet and dry line of the lower lip is literally touching those incisal edges, quote unquote incisal edges made with wax. With this wax rim, we're having a conversation. This patient can't talk with this because his tongue is not being interfered by anything. This is the actual position of those incisors. There's no wax on the back yet. We have, we'll, we'll add that wax rim later when we're going to get vertical dimension. But begin for, for starts, we're only doing the upper and the lower incisors so that we know exactly where those incisor light positions need to be, where the midline and the canine line also are located. Again, small photos. We go to the lower arch, lip in repose. We have him say M, 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 uh, and just keep his lip open. We want to see two to three millimeters of the incisor ledge there. That's what we're seeing with the wax. We get our face bow. Now we add the wax to the back of the both uh, 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 denture bases, upper and lower. And we have we we create a little bit of space, a bit, little bit of clearance between these wax rims. We create some retentive notches. We inject some re bite registration material, and we have our patient swallow. And again, I have a web full webinar on dentures on how I do that and why I do it that way. But this is what we're seeing here. Once the patient swallows and the bite registration material sets, we have now this vertical dimension. We we end with the face bow. We go ahead and we transfer all this information to our articulator and we send this to the lab. Once the lab gets this, they go ahead and you know send, send us back our wax try-in with the teeth exactly with what we requested. This is where we want the incisal edge. This is the midline. This is the canine line. 
this is the number of two, this is the the uh, the um, the reference for the teeth that I want you to use. I decide how wide, how long I want the teeth because I have all that aesthetic information the day that I was doing all my trials. So I give them all that information and now the lab can go ahead, add the teeth to the wax up. This is wax up teeth. You can see how beautiful, I mean, this is, it's just so easy for me just to use this type of techniques because when the, the dentures come back, I rarely have to do any alterations of, 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 you know, just minor. You always have to do something, but minor. We don't want to be doing huge changes of position of teeth. If we don't give our lab good information, they're just going to send us whatever best they can do. But you can see here, phonetics, again, trying with a denture in wax, with the teeth in wax. He's, he's, we're having this conversation. He's using different F words. He's counting from 60 to 70, from 50 to 60. We're doing, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of testing to make sure that everything is where it needs to be. Here is a denture now in maximum intercrispation. And and, and the, the patient is, is super happy. We didn't have to do any changes in this denture. We send it right back to the lab. If we have to do any changes, we do it right there at chair side. You know, when we have to do some changes and there are cases that we have to do some changes, you know, they're minor changes. We have taken so much time getting so much information from the lab that it's just minor changes that we're going to be doing. For this particular case, we didn't do any changes. We send it back to the lab. The lab sends us back the completed dentures. All we have to do from there on is just pick up the locator attachments and look at the before and the immediately after. This is probably six to eight months later from the day that we started with the attractions and implant placement till the day that we deliver the final dentures. So again, huge change, very, very motivated patient. And it's good that is that this is the result because we want this patient motivated. We want this patient to understand that if he doesn't take care of these implants, we're gonna end up back to square one, exactly the way that he started. So keep that in mind because that's something crucial. When we have these cases where we're removing all the teeth and we're placing four to six implants and we're doing hybrids, our patients need to understand that these implants also have complications, that the tissue around the periodontal tissue around these implants is not the same as the periodontal tissue around natural teeth. These peri-implant tissues are, are, are behave completely differently and they can be, they are weaker than periodontal tissue around natural teeth. So you got to make sure that you make you 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 allow your patients to understand this, you help them understand this so that there's always good care uh, after you deliver your cases. Uh, and again, just to show you that the sinus was, uh, you know, that, that that communication did completely epitalize for this patient and we were able just to deliver our final dentures without any, any issues. So this I think is my last slide and I want to thank everybody that was here in our third case review series. Uh, um, you know, where you, it, it's always nice to have people live while I'm recording, uh, but it's also even nicer to see how many clicks we get and how many views we get once we upload our videos in our YouTube channel. So again, thank you uh, one more time for being here live. And thank you if you watch this video after it's been recorded in our YouTube channel. Have a great rest of your day.